majority of browsing websites via a mobile device and mobile devices and how in a lot of respects that's, that's a game changer for web development. Um, so I what, what I want to do is I want to present um, a overview of sort of what the mobile world is like and then discuss strategies for building websites that work um, in a mobile environment. So first of all, in the mobile world, um, there, there's two ways that you can get your stuff out to people if you're an organization. There's two primary ways that you can do it. And one is via an app, and one is via a mobile website. What's the difference between the two? What's the difference between an app and a mobile website? Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm not really sure I heard a difference between those two things. Okay. Okay. All right. So the diff the, the difference is um, between the two, if we can identify that, between an app and a mobile website two strategies you have for developing content an app is a program that's downloaded and installed on a specific device A mobile website is simply a website as accessed through a browser on a mobile device. So yeah, strictly speaking, there's no such thing as a mobile website, right? There are websites. Now you may view the website on a browser or you may or a, a computer but or you may view it on a phone but there are websites yes right 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 Right. So a, a site may be optimized for mobile devices, or it may not be optimized for mobile devices, but th they're all websites, is, is what I'm saying. All right. One thing about this is the app needs to be downloaded and installed, and therefore it needs to be updated. Whereas in a mobile website environment, if you update the site, every user gets the updated content because it's out on the web so you don't have to people don't have to d install anything new to make it work apps are designed for different devices in other words I cannot run a iPhone app on an Android device and I can't run an Android app on an iPhone device so therefore if I wanted coverage for everything I would need to have both an, uh, uh, an iPhone and an Android version of the app. A mobile website in theory all right, um, will work across any platforms. Now we know from our experience with developing just regular websites that browser compatibility is an issue and it's certainly a, the, there's a potential for issue with it on a mobile website as well because again each Browser is a different piece of software, and as such, it's prone to have issues and, and things along those lines. All right. What's an advantage of an app compared to a website?
what's an advantage of an app to a website? Uh, given that an app is written for a specific device, it can be optimized for that device, if you will. So it can take advantages of all the features of that device. All right? As opposed to a mobile site, which could be optimized in general for the mobile environment, but it's much harder to make it optimized for a given platform. All right? uh, when you're developing an app, you're developing it for iPhone or for Android. Or, or whatever. So it can easily take advantage, more easily take advantage of all uh, of the features of that platform. What about downloading the app? Is that having to download the app? Is that an advantage or is that a disadvantage? Yeah, it's really both. How so? Okay. 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 Um, the uh, student mentioned some issues concerning the developer and pricing of an app. You can sell an app which is good because you can make money out of it, but that may also keep people from visiting your site if you're selling it. What about from the user perspective? What's the advantage or disadvantage of an app? Well, same it's, same it's, in okay, there's two same things in reverse. Okay. What about if all things are equal? In other words, if we're talking about a free app. So I got a free app. What's the advantage of that from a user's perspective? Well, what's the advantage that I have to download it from the user's perspective? It, it's free. No need to pay. Pardon me? No need, no need to pay. It's free, right? Ah, yes. Typically, an app, if you download it, you can use it regardless if you're connected to the Internet or not. All right? A mobile website, now again, these are speaking in very general terms because as the statement goes, you know, there's, you know, there, for every problem there's a solution, right? But it's easier to run an app when you're not connected to the internet and, and typically that's a, a, an advantage of it. You know, if you're going to play Words with Friend, well, that's a bad example maybe, but if you're going to play uh, Tetris um, and you download the Tetris app, you can play it even if you're driving through uh, well, I hope you're not driving, but it, if you're in a car that's going through a tunnel where there's no internet reception, you can still play it. Whereas if you were connected to the web, if you couldn't connect to the web, you couldn't do that. So that's a, that's a, that's a advantage of an app. What's a disadvantage related to the downloadability of apps? Well, it takes up space on your device. All right. Um, and you have to update it. Now, typically, uh, Android and uh, Apple's environment makes it easy to, to, to update things. All right? But you still have to do it. All right? You still have to do it, and you still have to go in and update it. And it's possible that they fixed a bug or, or some other issue, but you haven't downloaded it yet, and therefore you're still experiencing it. Compared to a website where if they fix something on the web instantly, that's fixed for the next person that requests it, whether they've downloaded it or not. All right. The advantage of the uh, of the the web is is actually the flip sides of the advantages and disadvantages of the app. Uh, a website ought to be a lot to a much greater degree uh, cross-platform compatible. So there could be some issues with it as there could be any browser compatibility issues with the website. But it doesn't matter if you have an Apple or an Android device, you can visit a mobile website and probably use it. All right? It's not as though 
a mobile website is designed strictly for one platform or another. All right. You get constant updates to it, right? Because every time you access it, you get a new copy of the page, and as such, any updates are, are seen by you immediately. All right. Now, which is the better approach to take for the organization? And the answer to that question is usually yes. <laughs> They're both the better approach to take. All right. Most organizations will have both an app and a uh, mobile version of their site, or, or, the, or they'll, they'll attempt to make their site um, um, work in a mobile environment. It's just a case. One second. It's just a case of covering your bases, right? Um, so therefore, if you look, you know, at, at most of the popular websites, you know, CNN, there'll be an Android app, there'll be an iPhone app, but there also will be a mobile website. All right. Um, the mobile website kind of covers things that maybe have slipped through the cracks, like maybe if you have a BlackBerry or a, a Windows phone, all right? And then they have optimized for the other two platforms. Uh, or if I want to visit CNN, but I don't want to go through the hassle of downloading the app. Maybe, you know, maybe I don't, period, you know, maybe I don't regularly check CNN, but on that particular day I want to look something up on it. Yeah, I can go to their mobile website. I'm yes? I'm curious about uh, specific capabilities of, of, of a specific capability of the app. Is the app uh, downloadable, is it for free? Do they have the ability to run in the background, or do they have to be uh, like, like many uh, Windows applications? They run in the background whether you want them to or not. Yeah, they, they, there's apps that run in the background. For example, my email is always running. And so if I get an email, it pops up on the screen an alert that says I've gotten an email. So even if I'm not, like, running it, it's running in the background. So CNN could develop an app that would update their main page background. So that if uh, you happen to be uh, in an elevator or in a tunnel, uh, you'd at least be able to get the headline. Yeah, there's all, kind of, all kinds of combinations of things that you could do within an app that would mix online versus offline browsing. Okay, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, it, this is not an either or, I guess is my point. Uh, an organization typically will cover that to cover both strategies. All right. So, they're going to develop an Android app, they're going to develop an iPhone app, and they're going to develop um, a mobile uh, website. All right. Now, as far as a mobile website goes, all right, this we're not going to talk about anymore. We're not going to talk about apps anymore unless I want to brag about my score in Tetris or something like that. So we're not going to talk about apps anymore. We are going to focus on, on mobile websites or mobile friendly websites might be a better term. There's sort of three strategies to take your website and make it work in a mobile environment. One is to do nothing. Well, that's not a very fun strategy, to do nothing. We don't have anything to talk about if we're not doing anything. All right. Now, For most websites, doing nothing is likely to be a problem, all right? Because if you've designed a website for a desktop environment and you try to view it in a mobile environment, it's probably not going to look very good. However, there are some small websites that are created that look acceptable and look reasonable in a mobile environment um, as they do on a desktop. That's probably not the way to bat, all right? Um, that's probably not your default situation, but if you think of a small, let's say a small website for a restaurant or something like that, where there's not a lot of options, there might be like, here's our menu, here's where our location is, here's our hours, you know, four, five, six pages, 
Something like that potentially could work both on a desktop and a, and a, and a mobile uh, environment. Especially when you consider some of the things that we've talked about like the last few days. Like um, using floating positions, um, using relative sizes of things, that is sizing things in terms of percentages instead of an absolute number of pixels. For small websites, you have the chance that this could happen, but usually that's not going to work, especially when you start talking about larger websites. All right? Your second option is to write what are called responsive pages. And keep in mind these things sort of mix and match. All right? In other words, you can use responsive techniques in your desktop website, and then you don't have to do anything. Or the third option, we can use some responsive techniques in the third option as well. And the third option is to have a separate website. For mobile. So these two strategies involve having one website that works for both. This one involves having two websites. And the example that was given in class earlier, Photo Bucket would be an example of a site that is optimized for mobile where it's a separate site. It has its own set of URLs. So instead of going to photobucket.com, you go to m.photobucket.com and you get the optimized site. All right? This do nothing strategy, we're really not going to talk any more about because really the only thing we'd do is we'd, we'd revisit some of the things about floating and all that. that if you're going to make your website work without any accommodations for mobile devices, then you better do the floating and the percentage of, uh, of, of uh, for sizing and so on. Separate websites, I'm just going to mention how that works in general. In general, it works in this way. You have a piece of code that runs on a web server. So here's the internet. Here's the client. Your web server has a server-side script. What's the server-side script? It allows the creation of dynamic web pages. What do I mean by dynamic pages? It means pages that change without any sort of human intervention. In other words, there is coded in the program uh, for the server-side script instructions that tell the web server what to do. So instead of specifying a web page, we give other instructions to the web server to do uh, one, of, one of two things. One script particularly is important here, and this script is sort of the traffic cop. It does what is called user agent detection. And depending on information from the user about whether they're on a mobile device or a, a desktop computer, that traffic cop either directs them to the, the, the full site, the site meant for the computer, or to the mobile site, that is the site meant for um, the mobile device. Let me show you an example of that. I'm going to go in and I'm going to type in my mobile browser. I'm going to go to the URL cnn.com.
Okay. Um, I don't want to do that one. Um, let's go to, let's try another one. Well, let's try the photo bucket example. If I type in the URL photobucket.com, Okay, this isn't doing it either. Um, well, you shouldn't. I'm right. 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 Um. All right. Here we go go to eBay. So I go to eBay.com. I just typed in, I'm going to select, I don't know how well you can see that, let me zoom in. I'm going to select eBay.com, that's what the URL says, www.ebay.com. If you notice, it pulls up that and it goes to m.ebay.com. All right. So the browser, the traffic cop on the web server looked and says, ah, this person's on a mobile device. All right. Therefore, direct them to the mobile pages. As opposed to if I were on a desktop computer, I type in ebay.com and I go to www.ebay.com. All right. So in both cases, I typed in the same URL, but I ended up in different places. Why is that? Because of the little traffic cop here that exists on the server and looks at the request and directs them either to the full or to the mobile site. All right. Now that's done in server-side scripting like ASP.NET or PHP or any number of server-side scripting languages. So that's not something we're going to learn in, in HTML. Um, when the user makes a request, they actually send all sorts of information uh, with them. They send information uh, of what their IP address is that can be used to determine an approximate location. They, uh, they, they send information about what device you're using. All right. Um, all right. Here's a simple example of it. There's a website called Detect Mobile Browsers. It knows that I'm not on a mobile device here. And it gives me that message saying no mobile browser detected. So it knows that this request came from a desktop computer. If I type in the same URL on my phone, if I can do that before my battery dies, It's smart enough to know that a mobile browser is detected. And it specifically knows that I'm running Android. And it knows what version of Android I'm running and so on down the line. And it actually knows what kind of phone I'm using. It knows I'm, I'm using a, a Droid X2. All right. So that's how the traffic cop does its thing. All right. When you make a request to the server in this process, 
you ask for a certain page, but you include information about yourself. And that information can be used by the traffic cop on the web server to send it to one direction or the other. All right, so that's all we're going to talk about that because to talk any more about that would have to do server-side scripting. All right, so what about the last strategy, the third strategy that we have here of what I called responsive pages? Um, we've already talked about um, responsive pages to some level because a big part of responsive pages is using the floating um, to make uh, the page responsive to the size of the browser. And again, if you think about it, that's, that's what responsive means, that it responds to like the size of the browser, the environment that it's in, and so on. So floating and relative sizes are a key component of that. We can even do that with images. We can make images be a certain size. Instead of saying an image is 200 pixels wide, we could make it 100%. Then it would fill up the size of um, the window or the content area that it was filling up. All right. So the three pieces of responsive web design are fluid grids, relative size for images and what are called CSS media queries. So the first First one we've addressed when we talked about the floating in the previous class. Relative size for images, that's simply using a percentage as the size of the image in the CSS. CSS media queries is the different uh, element that we haven't spoke about. All right. Now, throughout this course we've talked about one of our goals is to design websites where there's a clean separation between the HTML, that is the content, and the appearance. And all sorts of good things happen when you do that. All right? And there's some websites that allow you to pick the styling that you want for it. Sometimes they call it themes or skins or whatever where you can actually select that. All right? An example of that is, there's a site for the blind, that allows you, and again, again, blind or visually impaired, it allows you to customize your view by changing the color of certain elements, by changing the text size, and so on. This is one example of the contents the same, but because they did a good job separating the content from the presentation, there can be JavaScript going on in the background to apply different styles to the page. All right? Even in Angel, you can go and you can set your page's theme and you can make it look a certain way um, if you want. All that's doing is it's taking the content is in HTML and applying a different style sheet to it. So style sheets can be applied that way through code. There's a great website that really demonstrates just how much you can change a website based on just changing the style, style sheet. And that website is CSS Zen Garden. And they've actually changed this website to make it more responsive. 
So, I click on that. I want you to notice a few things. First of all, parse, this, each, each design that we're going to view has the exact same HTML. The title CSS Zen Garden, the phrase the beauty of CSS design, the text a demonstration of what can be accomplished through CSS based design, the road to enlightenment, so what is this all about? Participation, benefits, requirements. And I would guess that this page looks reasonably good even on my mobile device. All right, here's this site viewed on my mobile device. A little problem with the graphic there. That didn't show up, interestingly enough. But the rest looks reasonably good. Let's go to another example. CSS Zen Garden, the beauty of CSS design, a demonstration of what can be accomplished, the road to enlightenment, so what is this about? Go to another design. CSS Zen Garden, or Zen Garden, a demonstration of what can be accomplished, the road to enlightenment, and so on. This is as dramatic of an example as I can think of, of taking one piece of HTML and styling it different ways. So this goes beyond simply changing the color of some things or the fonts. This changes everything about the page. This changes the position and everything about the page. All right. So we're going to sort of apply that thinking as we create responsive pages. The fact that we can take our HTML page and style it any different way we want to. All right. And we're also going to rely on a fact that we haven't explored so too much in this class, but you can actually apply multiple style sheets to the same page. All right? And which style sheet will it get? It'll get both of them. All right? So here's the approach we're going to take. We're going to design a website using the mobile first approach. What does that mean? We're going to think about how it's going to look first on a mobile device. And we're going to get the styling to work on a mobile device. We're then going to go and add stuff in for the full desktop version of the site. All right? And traditionally, things gone the other way. People take a full website that was developed for a desktop and then sort of whittled away to make a mobile version of it. The thought is it's better to take the approach of, I'm going to just focus in on what's absolutely necessary as far as the content and the appearance for a mobile site, and then I can add stuff in. All right? That way I'm not cluttering it with unnecessary stuff. I'm starting down just very bare bones. Remember, what's the difference between how a user uses a mobile device versus a desktop? Well, the physical limitations, the size of the screen. The way that you interact with it. You interact with a mobile device typically by pointing on things. You should have saw me yesterday trying to click on a link on my mobile phone. You know, with my big finger, you know, I never could get the link between the two. I'd either get the one above it or the one below it. All right? Um, the other difference is, is that people 
visiting a mobile site are likely to have different goals than people visiting the, the, the full site. So therefore, you might want different content on the mobile site versus the full site. All right. For example, think of visiting Lorraine Community College's website. If you are visiting their regular website, you might be doing things like deciding what you want to major in, deciding what courses you want to take, um, deciding what you're going to schedule for next semester, and so on. If you visit their mobile site, chances are you're looking for a more immediate, quick answer. Like, I need to call the professor to tell him I'm not going to, I'm going to miss the midterm today. All right? Gee, we got a lot of slow, snow last night. Is classes can, uh, have classes been canceled? You know, things along those lines. So your goals in accessing LC's mobile website are likely to be very different than your goals for accessing the um, the regular site. If they're different enough, you might go to this. Uh, the web developers might go to this approach and just say, "Hey, I'm going to have two websites then." So if I determine that the goals of the mobile users are that much different than the goals of the desktop users, oh, I might go and develop a separate website and use, let the traffic cop send the, send the person in the appropriate direction. But if the goals are close enough, you might say, well, I'm just going to style it differently. And maybe I'll hide a little bit of content, because it's possible to do that as well via CSS. So let's look at an example I created that embodies the mobile first um, philosophy. I'm going to view it in the mobile emulator, all right, which is a way to test your pages without having to have a million different mobile devices. And I'm going to view the same page using the regular browser. So there it is in the mobile emulator. Whoops. Here it is on the full size web browser. That's the same HTML. All right. I'm just styling it differently. And again, you know, you could quibble a little bit with the design. Uh, the, 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 it's a little hard to read the type uh, on the background, but you get the idea. All right. What's the difference between the two? Well, the mobile device version is, is simpler. Right? And that makes sense, right? Because with the smaller screen uh, size and all that, you don't want to clutter with a lot of ex extraneous stuff on the mobile site. All right? It's a simpler layout. It's one column versus two columns. What happened to the image? It's not being displayed. All right. The thought is, is that, hey, you know, we don't want the image cluttering this up. It's not really essential. So I'm going to get, I'm going to keep that image off the mobile site. I did that as an example to show how through CSS we can actually hide content as well. And there's no background image because, again, the thought is, again, mobile devices typically have a slower connection. So as far as downloading things, in general, we want it to be simpler. It's going to be harder to see. If I were to view the full image on a mobile browser, it would be very difficult to read it. All right. Let's see how we do this then. Let's look at this page and see how we did it. First of all, we have First of all, I have this line in there, which 
helps get things right in a mobile environment. Notice I have actually a couple different style sheets. One I have is I have the Firefox Fix style sheet that we talked about in earlier classes. But these are the two style sheets I'm interested in. All right. Now notice the difference between these two style sheets. The second style sheet has what's called a media query on it. And what is a media query? That is conditions under which this style sheet will apply. So if the screen size is at least 601 pixels, the assumption is, is I want the full version of the site. Whereas if the screen size is less than 601 pixels, I'm not going to get the full version. So, no, this actually depends just on the width of the screen. All right. So if I add an ancient, you know, tiny little monitor, it would it would apply there as well. All right. So, mobile devices get this style sheet. Desktop devices will get this style sheet plus this style sheet. So I can put the things in there that I want common on all my site, on all versions of the site. I can put it in the base CSS. For example, if I had a certain color scheme for the text, if I had a certain fonts I wanted to use, that sort of thing. And I style it sort of in the most bare bones way that I want to. I can then go, and in my second style sheet, which doesn't apply all the time, it only applies when the width is less than 600, of the, the minimum width of the screen is less than 600, and it's not a mobile device, it's definitely a desktop, although sometimes browsers report this incorrectly, but anyhow, um, this will, to as great a degree as possible, assure that I'm on a desktop. There's going to be style rules in here that overrule the style rules in the first one. All right. So let's look at these two style sheets. Here's the base style sheet. Here is the desktop style sheet. So the base style sheet, I define, and this will apply for everyone, I, I define the fonts. I define sizes, again, in a responsive way. All right? I don't give a width in terms of an absolute number of pixels. I do it in a percentage. Interestingly enough, then, I say every image in the section display is none. All right? That answers the question, what happened to the image? All right? In the base version of the style sheet, I'm hiding that image. Because if we look at the HTML for this, that image is an image within the section. So I'm hiding that image. Now, let's look at the desktop CSS file. Here's why I'm overruling some things. All right? I'm giving it a different set of fonts. I could have kept the fonts the same if I wanted them the same on both, but I overruled it. I changed the background to have that image as the background image. That's why if we look at this in the browser, we see that little design in the background, whereas if we look on the, on the mobile device, we don't. Some of these things I set a width for of not 100%. I set a width of 30% with a minimum width of 200 pixels, and I float it to the left. I changed the LIs to be block instead of inline so that they stack vertically instead of horizontally. 
And I set the width of these sections to be 30% with a minimum length of whatever. Then I set the section image to display it. Remember in the previous one it was a display of none. And I set the width of 100%. So if I watch, notice how the image gets bigger and smaller. At a certain point that content drops down below. No. Because I didn't specify it based, I, I believe, I'm pretty sure the answer is because I didn't base it on the width, I, I defined the minimum width. In other words, I could make this at least 600. The, the, this is looking at the screen size, not the window size. Simply put. The, 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 the media query is looking at the width of the device, not the width of the window. So if I make the window smaller, the device still has a width of a thousand pixels, right? Okay, yeah. It's measuring the width of the screen. The device width is the width of the screen, not the width of the window. All right? So for that reason, it doesn't change. All right. We have a, we'll, we'll review this on Monday because I, I kind of rushed through the last m couple minutes of this. Um, so we'll revisit this on Monday before we jump into our next topic. All right, we'll see you up in lab.